involved with also had some rating issues. It's a, a film based on um, a comic that I, I absolutely loved uh, as a kid, 2000 AD, because you, you, uh, sure. you were, wrote uh, Judge Dredd. Um, uh, yes, I, I did. I did the production rewrite of Judge Dredd. I share credit uh, with uh, with uh, Waylon Green, excellent writer. Um, but uh, I was brought in because the producers knew me, and same thing. We want to we want to add some humor. Uh, we want to have some plot twists and things like that. Uh, and I had I had worked with I had developed a couple of movies with Sly that ever never that never got filmed. One was very famous called Isobar. It was kind of like yeah. Snowpiercer. Um, so I got along with Sly. So there were a lot of reasons to bring me in. Um, and um, I knew the comic book very well. In fact, about 10 years prior, I tried to get the same producer, Ed Pressman, interested in the comic book. Nobody in America knew the comic book prior. And even at the time we made the movie, the comic book had just been brought out in an American edition in the hopes it would familiarize Americans with the thing. So what I noticed right away is there were a lot of odd things that were not canon to 2000 and AD. Anyway, uh, I would notice things in the movie that were not canon. And then... Speaking of Cannon, Danny Cannon would, uh, uh, he was always, he was always saying that he had convinced everybody in the movie that everything in the thing, he would say, the fans will revolt if you don't do this. And mm -hmm. I would go, hey, that's not in the comic book. And he would get really annoyed when I would, you know, look, look uh, creative discussions are fine. He's a very talented guy. The show Pennyworth is fabulous. We've been watching it. Um, so uh, he wanted, he wanted a very dark, 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 pretty vision. Um, and uh, I've done dark, gritty. I, I've done, you know, Ricochet. I've done some pretty dark, gritty movies. Uh, mm. But I wanted that there was supposed to be some comedy released in this movie. Um, so he was, ex he would be increasingly annoyed whenever I would totally innocently say, that's not in the comic. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm not trying to be a jerk. I'm just going to And so he, and, and, they, and, they, and the people in the room would realize he'd been telling them for months, like something was in the comic, but it wasn't. So, <laughs> His frustration with me couldn't be made more clearly by the fact that in the scene where Sly stops a drunk driver in a flying car. Yeah. Which I wrote. But now he says, well, Mr. D'Souza, this is your third violation. So that was like, his, <laughs> that, was his, that was his payback to me by making the asshole in the movie uh, me. But, but, but the, the ratings thing, the yeah. ratings thing was, was crazy. This was going to be, again, a PG-13 movie with the hamburger deal and a toy deal. Now, again, I've been around the block. I know how to write a PG-13 movie. So for one example, there's a scene in the movie where there's a reporter who is getting wind of the uh, conspiracy that's going on with Armand DeSanti and uh, Jürgen Pruck now. Hmm. And he goes on the air. He doesn't know the details, but he says, I'll have a, I'll have a full report tomorrow. So th there's a scene where he goes home to his apartment and in the picture, we cast like, you know, a, uh, an elderly, you know, newscaster, like a, a respectful, uh, a respected senior newscaster. And he's at home with his wife. And I write in the script that this is the future, but these people have been in this apartment 60 years. It looks like your grandmother's apartment. There's like framed pictures of children. There's like, you know, she's knitting. It does not look like the future. It's like totally gemutlic. Hmm. So the wife says to him, Oh, uh, you're, you're walking a tightrope. Just don't worry. It'll be fine. Judge Dredd's like going to solve the whole problem. Uh, I trust Judge Dredd and the door opens and it's Armand DeSanti in, in Judge Dredd's costume and, he, and then he shoots. And I write, I type, cut to the window of the apartment and you see the curtains are closed. You see flashes of light and you hear machine gun fire. Mm -hmm. that's, what I, that's what I typed. So I get a phone call from Andy Vanya, who's one of the movies. She says, hey, we've got, uh, uh, we've assembled some of the first dailies. Why don't you come over and see them? So I jump on my bicycle. Uh, by the way, it used to be can ask me macho in my line of work, but now it's can ask me verde. You always win if you come in with bicycle clips on your trousers. You come to a meeting, <laughs> like you win. Uh, so I go in and he shows me the scene. I'm watching the scene, but then when Armand Asante kicks the door open, the camera does not cut to the window. The camera stays in the room. And this elderly couple are machine gunned like Bonnie and Clyde and Bonnie and Clyde. And their bodies are twitching and they're like they're all over the room. And the children's grandchildren's pictures are shattered and all and the whole room is destroyed and their bodies are twitching. And I go, Oh my God. Oh my god, Andy, 
this is we are so screwed. You just <laughs> lost your PG PG thirteen rating. And he says, No, I didn't. I said, What are you talking about? He says, He says to the picks up the he pushes the button. He says, Run it again. Again, once was enough. No, pay attention this time, Stephen. So I'm watching it again. I go, What was I supposed to see? He says, There was no blood. They were dry squibs. You just saw black bullet holes on the people, hundreds of black bullet holes, but no blood. That's PG. And I said, who told you that? They said, Danny Cannon. <laughs> I go, uh-huh. Well, I, I, I got to tell you, I've been doing this for 30 years, and there ain't no such rule. Oh, you must be mistaken. Maybe you're not. Like, fine. Okay, now another scene that I wrote, okay, was at one point, Armand, uh, at one point, Jurgen Prock now realizes he's gotten in bed with the lunatic, that he was well-intentioned for whatever reason. It's out of control. And he says, Rico, this has gone too far. I'm calling it off. And he, and he starts to leave the room. And Armand Asante says, Robot, kill Jurgen Prock now. Rip his arms and legs off, but save his head for last. I want to hear him scream. <laughs> and I type that the robot backs our, um Jorgen Pruck now, off camera. The camera does not pan. I'm typing this. Mm. All we see are shadows. We see Armand Asante watching with great amusement, Joan Chen, disturbed but fascinated, and we hear horrible screaming and gruesome sound effects. Right. right. Danny has a tremendously talented crew of puppeteers who made the robot. Right? Yeah. And he says, listen, while you're in your robot shop, make me a robotic Jürgen Prucknow. Uh -huh. So they made a life-size Jürgen Prucknow puppet with removable arms, legs, and head that squirted arterial blood. And they filmed that. <laughs> <laughs> wow. <laughs> so the movie is turned in for the rating, and it's rated X. Because of oh all God. these excesses. And these, these are the most extreme excesses, but at every opportunity there was in the movie to show blood or gore or gruesome, even the clones. The, the clones that come out of the vat were like oozing and mm -hmm. pustulating, you know, with like pustulating, oozing, and, you know, bladders all over them, you know. We had to cut back every shot of, the, of, the, of, of even the clones emerging from the tanks. They were so gross. <laughs> uh, so we're rated X. We recut the movie. It's rated X again. And now the studio is in a panic because remember I said you can't advertise toys for an R-rated movie. You can't, yeah. You can't even you can't even advertise an X-rated movie <laughs> during during daytime hours when children are watching. You can't have a hamburger deal at this moment when the movie's being rated. the The toys are being stamped out at the factory. They're <laughs> shipping the the car. They're shipping the cardboard boxes for the Happy Meal. So now we recut the picture drastically. All these things are cut to the minimum. The picture is getting shorter and shorter by you know, like five, seven minutes. It's all like the gruesome stuff being cut out. We turn the picture in the third time. You're only allowed to get three bites at the apple. It's rated X. It's a death knoll. What are we going to do? Somehow, some way, it was Jack Valenti's like uh, last few weeks as the head of the MPAA, somehow Ed Pressman went on bended knee. They gave us one more shot, and they rated us R. So at least it wasn't X. Yeah. Now the toy company sues the studio, sues Synergy, which is the production company, and uh, Hollywood Pictures, which is the division of Disney that did non-cartoon movies. The hamburger people, I think it was uh, Burger King, they sue. And, and they, set, they get settled out of court. They took a bath. Jeez. And now we see, what is the advertising campaign for this movie? You have an R-rated movie. It's based on a comic book. And in desperation, I, I, I don't know why, I, I, what they were thinking, they go, oh, let's do a comic book-oriented campaign. Now, already you have an R-rated movie of a comic book that nobody in America is familiar with. <laughs> Whoever's in charge of the advertising campaign the distinction between comic books and graphic novels and newspaper comic strips is lost on the advertising agency. So the advertising campaign is black and white newspaper strips, you know, with four or five panels. Yeah. You know, like, like, like peanuts 
Or yeah. like Dennis the Menace, right? Yeah. Black and white, right? That's the advertising campaign with dialogue balloons. And it was very similar to the, the, the campaign for the Phantom, which is about the same time. Like, stop evil. So there's cartoons, of, uh, cartoon drawings, very cartoony, not even as realistic as a Marvel comic, which are quite you know, commercial art now. Or, yeah. or 2000 AD, which is like the, the graphic design of that. Not that level. I'm talking about, you know, like su su Sunday strips. Um, stop thief. I am the law. Right? Uh, <laughs> this is the last straw for you, mean machine. So they're featuring characters that nobody knows in America <laughs> on the sides of... On the, so it's a juvenile campaign <laughs> for an R-rated movie. Uh, oh, wow. Now... Cut to, the, the payoff of the story is several years later, Stephen Cannell, uh, since deceased, a wonderful, talented guy, he was the king of television uh, in American television in the 90s. He was a neighbor of mine at Universal Studios, and I was producing Knight Rider. Uh, so I knew him personally. Uh, he calls me up out of the blue and says, I have uh, interest in Walt Disney uh, to, make a, uh, well, to make a motion picture out of my TV series, Greatest American Hero. You've been doing all these superhero science fiction movies. Um, you know the show. Do you have a take that could take this TV show to the feature level? So I see him a couple of days, and I pitch my take on how to make the movie version of the TV show, which had a lot of changes in it. You know, we're working in a movie, a bigger scale, bigger budget. Times have changed. Um, he loves it. We go into Walt Disney Studios. We pitch it to the development executives. One of the three times in a, a career of over 30 years where the people in the room applaud the pitch. Wow. Applaud, applaud the pitch. <laughs> I'm getting hands slapped on the back, shaking hands. We leave the building. Uh, Camel hugs me outside the elevator. Man, you brought it home. I get in the car. I'm driving home. I'm in a lot of traffic. It takes me like I'm just pulling into my driveway. My phone rings. It's Steve Cannell. He says, I don't know what the hell happened. They were so excited, they went right up upstairs, and upper manager said, Steve D'Souza, that son of a bitch, he gave us an X-rated movie, R-rated movie, we got sued by the hamburgers, we got sued by the toy people, he will never work on a, water, on a Disney or a lot or ABC ever again. And I'm going, it wasn't me, it was the director. <laughs> wow. As, wow. As it turned out, as it turned out, there were short institutional memories, people go to other jobs. I actually have worked for ABC and Disney since then. So like all is forgiven. Huh.